Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna talk about ergodic theory here. So I'm gonna dive into this a little bit. This is not an educational video by any sort of the imagination. It is just me talking uh, so you guys can see some of my thought processes. Um, think a little bit about her, how ergodic theory impacts uh, financial markets. And so this all kind of started for me um, there was a, so at Princeton, I ran into a bunch of really interesting people. Uh, one of them, I believe their name is pronounced G I G. I apologize if I butchered that. Um, but we started just talking about what is quantitative finance. They have a math PhD. I was super interested in just listening to what they're having to say and their, you know, theories and whatnot. And then I just, he asked, I think what I'm reading or what I'm been working on. And I was like, well, um, I've been working on, um, ergodic theory, this is kind of a side project. And, you know, as I do, I just want to understand more of this. Uh, one reason I'm super interested in this as well is because this is actually tied uh, to stationarity. And if any of you know uh, my thoughts on stationarity, I absolutely love it. Uh, this is the critical piece that every quant is missing out there. And I just laugh because everyone builds these garbage models has no idea what's going on. Uh, and this leads me to start thinking about the fact of, um, are there theoretical quants and are there going to be um, more or less like experimental quants? So thinking about this uh, from the aspect of like physics, so experimental quants, and if these things do exist, which I, I'm not sure if I should break them into this or think about this, um, I am definitely going to be more or less uh, a theoretical quant because I absolutely love the theory and what's going on with a lot of these different topics and issues here. So ergodic theory, though, just started out to be this thing that I just enjoyed. I'm just reading about uh, this student, this PhD student's wanting to know how this is applied now to finance. Uh, because they've written two papers on this, which is absolutely amazing. Maybe I'll link his papers below as well, but I'm super excited about it and I work a lot with it and it ties into stationarity and it has to do with time series. And I'm, I'm not a genius or anything on this sort of uh, theory here. I've just been working on through reading textbooks and tying these thoughts together and putting it all on paper. So I figured I'd do a little bit of it with you guys today. Um, ergodic theory though is the sense that if you have a time series, all right, so my, my pen has no longer no longer working for some reason. I will use my mouse, which the writing will be absolutely terrible, but I'll give it a shot. Um, essentially what ends up happening is you have kind of like this, this time here, T, and we bounce kind of around and we have some sort of process here that occurs across time. Now, when we think about time series, when we think about how things work. Um, so let me go back into this. What we end up really thinking about often is that we're thinking about the data is being drawn from some sort of distribution here. And I don't know exactly what the distribution is. Um, unfortunately, many people just make this really stupid and simple uh, normal distribution assumption here. And the issue with this is this is way too simplistic and this is not very realistic. And so often people just give up and throw their hands in the air because they don't want to go down the theory rabbit hole here. Um, but we're assuming you randomly drew from this normal distribution and we end up with some sort of time series here, whether it's a stock price or, you know, GDP, other economic factors. Um, but ergodic theory is kind of getting at the point that we have the possibility of multiples of these sort of processes here that all could be coming from more or less the same distribution. So we could call it a model. We could call it a system. We could call it a moment. I don't know, some sort of generating function, not a moment generating function, but some sort of function that's generating this data here. And from time series perspective, we often think about this as being pulled from some sort of distribution. Again, we don't want to think about normality or normal distributions. It's just coming from something. And what we're looking at here is that we have uh, these distributions across times. And what ergodic theory is stating is the mean across time. So if you took this as the mean, what is the average of this? Uh, is this average the same across time as it would be if we actually sampled uh, multiples of these at one point or a few points in time? That's the question. And so I'm going to explain a little bit why this is important and then go into finance with this. So why this is important is because the question being, um, do these means actually converge? So an example of a non-ergodic is going to be, so I'm giving up someone on this, this drawing tablet here, um, but would be like a loan, something that occurs and it doesn't reverse. So imagine that you have a loan at time T 
and we're going to go across this. And as we originate this loan, let's say it's a five-year loan here. So all about here, we have five years and it's going to have payments coming in. Let's say the payments are fairly ste steady in the sense that this is the payment amount. And then if the loan charges off, so the customer just defaults, it's done. It's non-ergodic because the issue is, is imagine now taking a sample of this, of this loan specifically and thinking like, okay, it defaulted in year two, right? We can't say though that, you know, the probability of this event occurring is going to be, you know, two fifths because the issue with this is it's not actually going to converge. And the question being is how many of these loans now would you need to actually make the mean converge? So, you know, it's not going to converge on an individual level here because different sorts of events are going to occur. Um, but the issue that we're looking at is we want to know how many of these, how many loans do I need as a firm to ensure that we will converge to the actual average of this. So you might do some data analytics, some modeling, some quant development here, and you might say, I have this portfolio and I had millions of records here because I went and got data from the industry and I modeled it out. And on average, uh, this is exactly how the loan should perform. And what you're gonna be expecting here is looking at what we call EL, which is expected losses. And what EL is going to be uh, probability of default uh, times EAD times LGD. And what we're saying is we're trying to figure out as a firm, especially a small firm or a startup firm, is how many of these do I actually need for this mean to converge, okay? Now, you can think about this from time series perspective as well when you're we looking at uh, these sort of time stamps drawn out here now. Is, is this data actually coming from a distribution? And which distribution is it coming from? So thinking about this from a modeling perspective here, you can think about this in the sense that when we have some, so this goes into stationarity and ergodic theory plays into stationarity in the sense that uh, we have some sort of functions. We'll say like Y is equal to beta one X one plus, uh, I'm going to say, you know, beta two Y T minus two as an example here. And this is time T. Uh, when you have non-stationary data, and also in the fact that it's non-ergodic, uh, these beta coefficients are not going to be stable. And part of this is the fact that when we do the estimation procedure, it's not converging. There's a convergence issue. This convergent issue is part of the ergodic theory in the sense that I can take all this data, I can take that time series I had, and I just have one strand of this time series here. And we can try to estimate the relationship, but for some reason, when you add more data to it, the beta coefficients are constantly moving and they're not moving within a range here. So as you add new data, of course, and you reestimate, your betas are gonna move around a little bit. Um, but often the betas, when you have non-stationary data or non-ergodic data, uh, it's gonna happen is that you're going to see the beta coefficients jumping or they're like trending in a direction, like the relationship itself is not stable. And so that's something to think about when you start thinking about credit portfolios, right? You start thinking about the data here. We never think about time series. We never think about ergodic theory. Um, but when you start to work at smaller firms and you start to think about these things, even from like an investing standpoint, how many stocks do you need? How many different types of assets do you need to truly diversify? And there are whole papers written on this. You can Google them and find them online. The, the question being though is if you model them out and your model says we have an expected return, which is going to be the average return of this strategy and position here. So this can be loans, investments, whatever you want. Uh, the question is, is it going to actually converge or is your data non-stationary, non-ergodic? This is one critical issue on why uh, portfolio theory, when they do uh, the efficient frontier and they do, you know, I think it's Markowitz or whatever optimization, it fails almost every single time because what you're putting into that model is non-stationary. And so when you go to optimize or you go to do some sort of model or some sort of calculation, if it's not going to be stable and consistent, uh, those averages are not going to converge. And when they do not converge and new data is being added to these models here, what ends up happening is we don't have actual meaningful relationship. We're just gambling. We're just fitting a line to dots and looking in the rear view mirror. And then as the future comes, we just, you know, we don't know. We don't know what's happening. The models become essentially useless here. Now, when you want to go down the rabbit hole on this a little bit more, a little bit how I think about this, my question is, let's say you have some sort of time series here and it's time T. Now, I told you before, we had some sort of distribution here that looks like this. 
Uh, and we are just assuming we're pulling from some sort of distribution. Now, I see industry practitioners say, well, you just take historic data and then you just resample it. This is dumb. Um, I'll tell you why it's dumb. The reason why it's dumb is if you just took the historic data and you sampled it, you're going to be missing pockets and pieces on where that data could have been different values. And what I mean by this is granularity level. So let's say you take the stock price as the opening price every day for the next, I don't know, 10 years. That stock price is never going to have a representation of some values in between the values. When the stock price itself is moving throughout the day, it's probably hit all of those values, but you're not going to reach them. So you're better off taking historic data, fitting a distribution in itself, and then using that non-parametric distribution or parametric if you can get it to happen uh, and sample from that to get more data. But that also assumes that it's ergodic. So we have to assume that that, that data is going to be from a distribution. Now, why I'm saying this is what if that distribution itself is actually shifting across time? Okay. Now, if this, this shift and means is happening slow enough or even fairly fast, we probably won't notice. We will just assume, as we're pulling more now from the green distribution versus the pink one here, uh, we're just assume that we're drawing out uh, more data from here in the pink distribution. It just happens to be an anomaly, a random event that occurs. Like we just happen to be, you know, hitting heads more often, the probability framework. But it's not. The distribution is changing. Um, another piece I think that a lot of people don't think about, and again, these don't have really easy, simple solutions. This is why it's like theoretical quant. Um, what ends up happening is this is just talking about. I'm just saying the mean. So if these were, you know, distributions that had mu as a parameter, so these are parametrics, uh, but the expected value here, the mean, so the mean of these distributions uh, is going to be shifting. That's one thing to consider. When we start to look deeper at stationarity, for example, and the definitions behind stationarity, and as I'm getting down the ergodic textbooks, I'm getting really excited. A lot of these things are coming up too, in the sense that we assume that it's mean and variance. So variance is the second moment. If you remember, uh, there's four moments that we typically look at with distributions that define them. Uh, variance is going to be the risk in financial terms, which I would argue is short-term risk and stupid person risk here because it's way too simplified to be actual risk. But we could say, what about the variance? What if the variance is changing? So now what if this green distribution is not uh, just shifting in mean? What if the variance of that is changing? How do we detect that? And how does that, how does that result differently on our time series here, because often, right, this is probability theory. Um, the issue being is, are those converging in the sense that, you know, is this distribution changing? If the distribution itself is changing, so if we think about this in uh, stationarity terms, uh, it could be I1 in the sense that the growth rate of that change, that data process, is going to be stationary, but the raw data itself is not going to be stationary. So the time series world calls it non-stationary. It drives me nuts. It's technically, it's I1. It's integration one. So if you difference it once, we end up with a stationary process here. Now, there should be much more research on how to make things more stationary besides just differencing, which I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, but again, the variance here is going to be a simple risk factor here. Um, I'm not going to cover too much of my theory on this, but there's the, the mu, there's variance. Uh, the third moment, I believe, is skewness. So we have skewness here. Um, I would argue in financial terms and just in reality, this is called model bias here. So in my unintention, unintended model bias presentation of machine learning and stats, we look a lot at skewness. So this is something that should be looked at a lot more. And then the final one's going to be called kurtosis. And kurtosis is going to be the fourth moment. And this is going to be the tail risk. This I'm going to call it in financial terms. Uh, but this is going to be uh, basically the relationship between the middle of the distribution and the tails of the distribution. And so often when you have high kurtosis, which is called platycurtic, uh, platycurtic distributions are very flat. However, there's not a lot of extremes in the tail. Uh, when you have something that is going to be leptocurtic, the distribution is very, very tall in the middle. However, you have really, really, the tails come down and look very small. However, the issue is the tails go out very, very far. And so now we have tail risk in this strategy here. Uh, again, I'm not going to go, and there's a whole financial theory behind this, but these sorts of things as they deviate and change could be a distribution of itself shifting across time based on human behavior, based on, uh, you know, 
government strategy. So economics impacts financial markets here. That's why I think economics is such a critical piece of quantitative finance, because all the stuff I'm talking about is taught in econometrics classes. All of it is taught in the fact that we're looking at things like GDP, unemployment, uh, all these policies and things that drive these variables that drive the performance of funds and firms, which drive stock prices and interest rates, which drive the cost of loans and how much money is going to be available. It's a whole economic theory here. Um, but then the other question is, is, so now I'm talking about distribution shifting. What if this is not the case? What if we actually have multiple distributions that we're pulling from with different probabilities here? So let's imagine we have a distribution that looks something like this. And what if we have a second distribution that looks something like this? Now, if we have different probabilities, so I'm starting to think about this now in the sense that we're looking at this from, I think they call them state space models. Uh, but you can think about it like in a Markov chain or a Markov process here, as we have multiple states and there's probabilities going between them. Imagine now you have two separate distributions and you have some sort of probability. So let's say this is like 82 point, I don't know, just say 82% probability of hitting this distribution. And the remainder 18% of the time uh, we're actually pulling from this distribution. So if we think about this from random draws and pulls, now going back again to the theoretical piece here. So I want to emphasize this a lot to you guys. Learning how to fit models is not that complicated. Learning how to fit models correctly and the decisions made to choose the model and make the decisions and look at the analytics and make all these critical pieces and structural designs to your models comes down to the theory piece here. And that's what we're trying to do to show you guys a little bit more here. Um, but again, if we're drawing this time series and it's coming from two different distributions and these distributions are being drawn at different fractions and rates, how do we estimate that? How do we get to that? Uh, this process might look in itself to be non-ergodic or non-stationary, but again, we don't know how this is being put together behind the scenes here. So. Anyways, I just wanted to dive down this rabbit hole a little bit with you guys talking about ergodic theory, talking about the fact that it's looking at time itself. So there's one strand of time. So this one time series here is this, you know, representative of the actual process here. So if we estimate a model on this, will the coefficients, as I kind of pointed up up here, like our betas, uh, are these going to stay stable? Or are they going to change? Or more importantly, do we have something more complicated like this scenario down here with two distributions or three distributions or multiple states being pulled? Or do we have what machine learning just waves their hands and says is model drift or data drift or whatever? Um, we might be able to estimate these sort of things here and be able to convert these into some sort of theoretical construct into a mathematical modeling piece. And that math modeling piece can be tested then, um, for example, for stationarity. And we can see that we can create an ergodic process by the sense of breaking down the model into these different components, testing all of the components, and then putting all of it back together into one actual framework here. So these are just some pieces of thought for you guys. This is how my brain works. Um, again, as I'm working at work, I had no intentions of ergodic theory in my textbooks, my personal reading and research uh, to touch anything I'm actually working on it is magically like showing up and things I'm having issues with have all been somewhat solved by this fact that I've been reading these textbooks, which have been jarring my memory uh, and giving me new ideas and new things to think about in our modeling framework here. So anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you guys found this video helpful, please, please share this online uh, on LinkedIn, Twitter, somewhere, because other people will find it. They will find it helpful, hopefully as well. And it will help kind of move this channel forward so I can make more great content like this. So anyways, until next time.